some key ideas to demolish here. Um, when YouTube first came along, one of the ways that people tried to explain YouTube usage was through network principles, and I looked at network principles in particular in week one or two, something like that. Um, the idea was that YouTube would create vast networks of people to share interlinking content with one another, and that would be a wonderful, cuddly, fluffy thing, because people would all get on, and then we'd have participatory action, and we'd have participatory groups, and everyone would hold hands and dance and sing, and it would be lovely. Um, YouTube pushes up content which receives support from other users. That's the best way of crystallising it from Henry Jenkins. Henry Jenkins, bless him. No, don't bless, he's a misogynistic prick. Bless him for trying, though, to be right about things which he is most egregiously wrong about all the time. Um, <coughs> Jenkins completely ignores the fact that large corporate media companies' content is popular on social TV. The most popular content which is consumed on platforms like TikTok and YouTube is actually content produced by what we would call traditional media companies. Film companies, television companies, etc. What he's talking about here is user-generated content like you and I might produce, and that stuff is not surfaced by these companies. In fact, it's actively suppressed because their major customers are the major media companies. So we've got transnational media corporations who are exploiting users over and over again, generating surplus value through our unpaid labour in order to buy their products. The YouTube by themselves is not the most popular content on YouTube, for example. The TikTok creator is not usually the most watched content on TikTok. It is traditional media content which is actually watched much more than user-generated stuff. So these are not social media which prioritise our content. That marks them as radically different to other forms of social media which, in which our content is prioritised. Now, Jenkins argued that YouTube was a site for production and distribution of grassroots media and that on YouTube participation occurs through the same levels, production, selection and distribution. Writing in 2008, that might have made sense, but the truth of this was already apparent by 2008, that the vast amount of content being consumed was actually content produced by major media corporations. Because YouTube is owned by Google, and the revenues that are accumulated with online advertising on YouTube do not belong to the content producers, but to the shareholders of Google. So Jenkins neglects ownership as a central aspect of this participation network. Most popular YouTube videos steam, stem from global multimedia corporations like Universal, Sony, Disney. The only company outside of digital media who can rival the digital media companies in terms of evil is Disney. Disney are the most evil of all the old companies. God bless them. Their evil will live forever. But what they've been able to do is successfully leverage and move over onto these platforms to maintain a hegemonic position in media markets. So Jenkins, unsurprisingly, is wrong yet again. Politics on YouTube, Twitter and Facebook are possible, but they're minority issues. The predominant focus of users is on non-political uh, political entertainment. I've sticked the other ones in because what Jenkins doesn't realise is that the same factors which happen on all social networks happen on YouTube, and we can extend that to TikTok as well. You can make as much participatory content as you want on something like TikTok, and nobody's going to watch it. Because instead, the decision about what people are going to watch is being made by the company themselves to leverage their profits. So, this is not participatory in the true sense of the term. So YouTube as a platform has meant that existing content providers have had to adjust to it, but that means that existing content providers from before the digital age have adjusted to use platforms like YouTube and TikTok as distribution channels. They have made the adjustment to do that, 
and they are dominant on those platforms in terms of the content being consumed by people. So the DIY aesthetic of these things is a total myth. There is little that is amateur about generally popular material on those platforms at all. Even the user-generated content, which is popular, is not amateur in nature. It is not participatory or, gra or grassroots. People who are accruing vast amount of sums, like we saw at the beginning, they are putting genuine production techniques into the production of their content. They, for $570 an hour, I'd be hiring crew to produce my content. And that's what happens. These are just mimicries of the traditional media um, corporations themselves. And at the end of the day, these platforms are owned by giant media corporations in their own right, and their interest is in making as much money as possible. Now, because of that, we should notice that something like TikTok is a really contentious form of social media, because our participation as producers of content on that platform is small. Many of us won't produce any content for a platform like that, and if we do, we will get very little traction in terms of the global numbers. If you consider that there are a billion users of TikTok per month, should we be happy that something we posted on TikTok got 200 likes? Because in that bigger context, that's nothing. You know, that isn't 0.001% of users. It's less than that. We are nobodies on these platforms. Even if we feel ourselves that, sorry, I don't mean, I'm not calling anyone a nobody, by the way, right? You've got intrinsic words, which is way beyond some shit video on TikTok, right? Um, so the ability to produce sits in tension with the corporate ownership of the platform, which prioritizes content which will make it the most money. Therefore, we are limited. We are strictly limited in the eyes of how these platforms operate. So, how can we think about these? How can we conceptualize this accurately? Well, let's flip social media on its head for a minute. So for many people, YouTube and TikTok are not places to stream hand-me-down culture, but a site for novel cultural reproduction. What that means is that instead of producing stuff off scratch, instead of being users who are producing lots of things, and instead of it being hand-me-down culture, which is, we're just consuming, by nature, when we interact with texts on these, and we comment, we like, we share, we are actively engaged in the process of creating different meanings for them. Now, this makes more sense in the context of what Dave Arditi calls streaming culture. And he thinks the streaming culture should be called, should be thought of as both a noun or a verb. There is a streaming culture, and streaming culture is something we do. Some streaming culture is something we're part of. We are not simply passive part, you know, recipients of streams of information. Instead, we're always, by nature of how we interject with them, we are doing things to that as well. So I think the best way to understand something like TikTok or indeed YouTube is in this concept of streaming culture. Streaming culture actually originates or is foundationally based in the thought of a Welshman, which is a kind of unique thing. I, I wonder if you've had any people from Wales cited in any sort of lecture previously in the media studies degree, but Raymond Williams here is indeed a Welshman. He's only just a Welshman, he's from Abercavenny. So it's only just in Wales, but it'll we fuck we take it, right? So, Raymond Williams from Abercavenny. Um, his I'm only taking three words here. So I'm not giving him a huge amount, right? Culture is ordinary. What Williams means by that is that we sometimes are tempted to think that culture is some big thing out there which happens. What Williams encourages us to do is think, no. Culture's what we do. Culture's what we do every day. The things that we do every day, the things we consume, but also our practices, how we talk about things, those are culture. Culture is just an ordinary, everyday thing. And when we think of it in those terms, 
then we get an idea of what things are actually cultural, like watching loads of stuff on TikTok, for example. Williams argues that we are in the circuits of culture, and there's a constant relationship between cultural consumption, production, representation, identity, and regulation, which happens without us thinking about it. It's so ordinary that even though we're a part of it, we never think about it at all. It's the background to our lives, but it's what we do as well. So Williams encourages us to think about culture as the things that we actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's where Dave Arditi comes in with his funny hat. I've tried to, try to get him to come and do a speech here in Swansea, but unfortunately we haven't been able to coordinate stuff. But I will succeed one day because he's a really interesting guy. Dave Arditi coined the term streaming culture in 2021. And what he means by it is two kinds of things. And it's all rooted in this idea that culture is all good. For Dave Arditi, streaming culture is what we consume, so what, we, you know, what is given to us, but also the culture we identify in that consumption itself. So what we actively do to identify culture and build culture ourselves. So for example, what does he mean by that? Well, if we take an example, how many of you have watched Friends on Netflix? None of you? You fucking liars. Loads of you have watched it. I don't like Friends. What? I don't like Friends. You don't like it? Yeah. Why? Because it's boring. I like not see it. It's shit. Yeah. It was shit in 1994 and it's shit today as well. But um, do you all know what I'm talking about at least? You're aware that there's a television show called Friends, right? Okay, good. I can continue with the bit then. So I remember Friends when it came on on Channel 4 in 1994. My potted review of episode one, piece of shit. It never got any better than that, unfortunately. Bunch of whiny white people in New York. No fucking people of color at all in it. No people of different sexuality. Fat shaming all over the place. That program, piece of shit, okay? However, Friends has had something of a renaissance when it became part of the streaming service Netflix. Especially during the pandemic, ironically, because it's kind of comfort TV for people, like, you know, you don't have to think about it. It's the same six broadly good-looking people every week doing the same kind of shit every week, you know, it's, it's kind of, you don't have to engage the brain or anything like that. People really like that kind of junk. There is a different cultural aspect to it. In 1994, Friends was eh, broadly offensive if you thought about those issues in a broad sort of manner and you were aware of them, but it was also indicative nearly all the other television content that was around at that time as well. It was kind of normal at that point. And a lot of people wouldn't have thought about, you know, how can a programme in New York City have more black people? What the fuck is going on? You know, or how can, like, somebody who works as a waitress and somebody who works as an unemployed chef have a massive apartment in the middle of Greenwich Village? How does that work? You know? Because those things would be completely impossible. Well, one of the answers to that would be white. Um, and it could have been an interesting program to explore that, but it doesn't. Anyway, those are cultural issues that we engage with in it. Now, the cultural aspect of watching Friends in 2021 is far removed from the cultural aspect of watching it in, in 1994 when I watched it. It's a very different show because the cultural, the cultural milieu in which it's being received is completely different at that time. This is what Williams means with culture is all the ordinary has actually moved on from 1994, and now it's got a different kind of program. What amazes me is that people really like the program. But, you know, the taste is, you know, people like the program, fine. You know, it's not the end of the world. But the people, like, don't still question these things. That tells us something really important about the culture that we exist in. That tells us something incredibly important, because there was a cultural moment in the mid-2000s, for example, where Friends was getting hammered all the time, just about when the program was coming to end. It was being deeply criticised as a, like a cultural holdover from a different age, but it still prioritised the lived experience of white, wealthy people over the experience of lots of other people in urban environments, for example. There was a lot of discussion about how Friends was exclusionary, how it was transphobic, how it was fatphobic, 
you know, there, there is a prominent trans character in Friends played by a woman. Why didn't they get a trans actor to do that? Yeah. It'd be interesting, played by a woman who's got a really deep voice as well. Is that, is that sufficient? There was these questions being asked. In 2021, it doesn't seem like the same questions are being asked. Now, there's a transitory moment there in terms of culture itself, because the culture in which we actually identify the program is always in transition itself, and it tells us something about the cultural moment, how that's being received. So this is what Dave Arditi means by this. We consume stuff here, but we always consume it within a culture itself, and that culture is really important to how this happens. So, basically, we are always locked in these two things. We're always consuming, but we're also, oh, I'm, oh, spelling mistake, it should be two M's there, sorry. Um, but we're always in a process of commodification as well, because that's the broader culture in which we exist in. So, RDT takes this idea of what well, this is what streaming culture is, and brings it to a conclusion here that he calls we're in a new age of capitalism itself. The age of unending consumption. And this is the important thing when we think about TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, these are all examples of what they are being calls unending consumption. So, what does he mean by it? Hands up, all of you in this room who have a Netflix account. Lovely. By the same show of hands, how many of you have finished Netflix? That is, watched everything on the platform. You unfinished it? Yeah. You need to put in more effort. That's slacker behaviour. <laughs> Why haven't you finished Netflix? You have an account. You're giving them money every month. What, what is wrong with it? You're just handing them over money for no reason. Why haven't you watched every piece of content available on the platform? It's too much. It's too much. Again, you're not applying yourself. You need to get in there tonight, put Netflix on, Hold your eyelids up by like sellotaping them to your face and watch that shit, right? Get somebody to drop eye drops in at regular intervals and earn your money's worth. It's too much. I've never heard such nonsense in my time. Let's go back to some of those figures from earlier. 300 hours of content on YouTube every minute. Is it possible for us to ever catch up? Now, I, I guess with something finite like Netflix, I suppose if you started as an infant, theoretically you possibly could watch everything on Netflix for the entirety of your life, if Netflix like stopped at some point and never produced anything new or never brought any new programs. I guess you could do that. Um, I wouldn't, uh, that sounds like a really extreme form of child abuse to me, and I'm not advocating that that's what's done, right? Now what RDT says is that contemporary culture is basically unending. We are in a process by which there is no beginning, there is no end of this culture. It is just come always just flowing onwards and onwards. You will never run out of things to watch. If you have a Spotify account, do you think you can listen to everything on Spotify? I don't think that's humanly possible. You could live to 300 and you wouldn't be able to do that, right? Um, so we're in this age now, which comes from the streaming age of which YouTube and TikTok are peculiar examples of the streaming age, but they are streaming applications nevertheless. They give us streams of unending consumption. We can never finish it. We can never be stopped. Well, there is no end. It will go on forever. Now, this is rooted in applications like Spotify. So this is where our DT talks about these things specifically. So when we subscribe to media, we provide companies with constant and consistent consumption of that product. I view Spotify here, but Netflix is perfectly applicable in this, Amazon Prime is, Disney Plus, Paramount, whichever service you use, this is all <coughs> equally applicable, right? We get ubiquitous mobile access to individualized media. In return, they give us with more than we could ever consume. What's the net result? 
we're always continuing to sigma forever going onwards. So the deal here is I give Spotify, what do I give them, tenner a month, something like that? I can't even remember what it is. It's been going on so long now, this horrific relationship I have with this Swedish company. I give them that, and they give me the option to listen to anything I want, basically, forever, ever, 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 to the point at which I can never exhaust the possibilities of what I have. This is unending consumption. Now, what streaming has done is wiped out one form of media altogether. I had another show of hands, and it's away from the camera, so don't worry about it. Um, who um, knows how to um, torrent a film? You don't count. Uh, I know why you know. <laughs> uh, I got Connor. Who else put that? Liv, did you put your hand up? No. Okay. No? Okay. Good. Sir. Just Connor. God. Uh, well, no. Well, okay. So Billy knows how to do it. I know how to do it as well, right? So, do you want, do, do any of you not know what I'm talking about when I say torrent a film? Okay, fantastic. I don't know. You don't know. Okay. So um, <coughs> that there is a graphical representation of a company. A company that was extremely important in the 2000s, the Pirate Bay. Pirate Bay was a Swedish company set up basically as a search engine. Pirate Bay didn't host any material or anything like that. It wasn't a company where you just went onto their website and downloaded something. What the Pirate Bay was was a conduit. So torrenting works in a very peculiar way. It's a perfect example of user generated content, in fact. You would have, perhaps, let's say a film from the 2000s, which was um, Pirates of the Caribbean, right? One of them shit films, they're terrible as well. So let's say Pirates of the Caribbean 2, you wanted to watch that film. Now you've got two choices back then, right? You can go to the shop and buy a DVD, I don't know, 15 quid. Or you can go to the Pirate Bay and download it for free. What are you going to do? Download it for free. Damn right you're going to download it for free because that's going to save you money. Pardon? So what you got here now? How does it work? Pirate Bay doesn't host any material whatsoever. Instead, what the Pirate Bay will do is host a link to something called Torrent. You have a piece of software on your computer called Torrent Client. Popular ones were like uTorrent and uh, BitTorrent and a few others like that. So you have a piece of software on your computer, you download the file. That software on your computer allows you to link to every other person who has that film on their computer in a completed form. So let's say something popular like Pirates of the Caribbean, maybe 50,000 people around the world have got that sitting on a hard drive somewhere. Because you've downloaded the software and the file itself, the torrent, the, application, the protocol that allows you to take this, instead of downloading from one store, which is basically how streaming kind of works, instead you're picking up little bits of information from every other person in the network who has that file on their computer. So you're not downloading the whole thing from that person over there, you're downloading 10 seconds of the film from them, and you're pulling that in from everyone else that has the file. That's how torrenting works. It's interesting because you can't get done for theft as an individual, because you didn't steal it. You were given it by 10,000 other people. Go and sue them. And of course they can't because they can't even know where they are after, right? So it's an interesting sort of get down. Legally speaking, it's not legal, but it's hard to get prosecuted for. So this was really popular in the 2000s. People like me, who grew up in the 90s, where <coughs> you would go out and it's like, have a favorite band or something, I see uh, Jess, you've got a Nirvana t-shirt on, right? So let's go back to 1993, November <coughs> 1993, right? I'm going down to HMV in Swansea, which isn't in the place it is now, but it was quite close to it. And I wanted to buy Inuptura, right? So I go down on a Saturday with my hard earned money from, I don't know what the fuck I was doing, mowing lawns or something like that. And I go pick up a copy of In Utero and give the person in HMV £17. £17 for that album. Poor man, I couldn't afford £17. It was ridiculous. So, you know, I really resent <coughs> buying music as a kid because I love music. I spent all my money on CDs to make people millionaires when I had to afford, right? So when the 2000s came along, 
<laughs> I'm never buying a piece of music ever again. I would go and I would download entire back catalogues of bands that I like. Okay, because I never had this album or this album. Because I simply couldn't afford to buy all these albums because they were too bloody expensive. I would go and download every bootleg copy of a band or every live performance. I'd get everything, right? And download them onto my hard drive and my computer and put a real writable CD in the drive. And I basically turn my one of my rooms of my house into an, into a factory for making CDs, basically. And just like fuck you, music industry, fuck you, hate you guys. You're ripping me off for years. I'm gonna rip you guys off. What happened to the music industry when people like me started doing that? I've got completely. <laughs> the uh, revenues of the music industry collapsed entirely when uh, piracy sites came out. All of a sudden, they went from one of the biggest entertainment industries to be an industry in deep, deep trouble. And the music industry did not know, they knew they were never, ever going to get these people back. If you had the option, the two options available at the time, go and buy music or download it for free, people weren't going back to, down, to buying it in the shop. That was never going to happen. Fortunately, there was another Swedish company who thought that this Swedish company sucked, and they were called Spotify. And fortunately, again, there was a big digital media company who came along and thought, we might have a solution to this as well. They were called Apple. In 2001, Apple were also dead, basically. They haven't released a good product in years. Their revenues were right down. And now one of the biggest companies in the world at that time was a very small company until in 2001 they came up with a really neat little gadget called an iPod, which they no longer make it. iPod was the f not the first MP3 player because Apple's never invented anything. They've just taken other people's ideas and put it in a nice case. That's their entire business model. But what Apple did was notice that this was a way perhaps to get a new share of the market. So Apple created the iPod. And in creating the iPod, they also created the iTunes store, where you could buy any song you wanted for 99 cents. And that started the fight back against piracy, basically, because record companies realized you could actually vend singles by the track at an affordable price, and people were actually willing to do that, because a lot of people still want to give money to musical artists, because they think that's important. But that wasn't going to be enough, because what I did with my first iPod was, I would go on Pirate Bay and download all the music for free and then load it, side load it using a hack piece of software straight onto the iPad, onto the iPod, so it wasn't fixing it. So the music industry was really strong. And then Spotify came along with a bizarre sort of offer to the music industry, which was this. We're not going to fix your problems and it's not going to go back to the way it was, but what we're going to get people to do is pay tenner a month to have access to everything. Every piece of music that's ever been made in the past and everything that will be made in the future for ten or a month. And yeah, you're not going to get your revenues back to what they were, but you're going to get something. And at the moment, you're going to get nothing and the entire industry is going to fall apart because there's not going to be any new music because you're not going to have the money to actually put albums out because you're going to go bankrupt. So take this offer that we've got or the whole thing is going to go under. And, basically, that's the story of the first streaming network, which is Spotify. Spotify launched in 2008. I got my first account in 2009 as an early adopter. Um, and I was amazed. I would type in something into Spotify and that became I, I remember spending the first hour of it thinking, think of the most obscure fucking shit that you can to see if they, and they had it. I was like, oh my god, what's going on? This is amazing. It just blew me away. And it was instantaneous. It wasn't like the internet back then, which was like, mm -hmm, it takes ages. It was like, whoa, this happened straight away. Streaming completely changed that entertainment industry in its entirety. Very shortly afterwards, Netflix would come and change television and film in exactly the same way. The where it came from is trying to get rid of what we call the on-demand economy, which was basically piracy. You can get anything you want at any time for free. Instead, we have a streaming culture that emerges and says, yes, I am happy to pay this amount of money to have a convenient experience 
very smooth, works on all my devices, I can get anything I want, I don't have to download illegal software or do illegal activities to get this thing. And you know from 2009 I've had a subscription to that service and I'm quite happy to actually pay 10 bucks a month. I'm still cheaper than what I was paying for one CD when I was a kid. For adjusted for inflation in intro would be like 30 quid now. I could have had like three lines of coke for that back in the day. What is going on? So, that is the story of streaming, my friends. So, these companies that have emerged in the streaming revolution, like Spotify and Netflix, use these technologies to change the way that we actually consume culture itself. So, it embeds us in a logic of capitalism that forces us to consume and actually to consume more because we've got a finite amount of time to consume all that stuff which is pushed to us. Now this is what Dave is going on about when he talks about unending consumption. We are now, through our subscriptions, locked into consumption. To justify my £10 a month to Spotify, what do I listen to on my phone? Spotify, right? The, the actual content that I'm listening to is not really that important. I am listening to that. I am not putting my own music onto my phone as files. Why would I do that? I'm paying for this. So I'm constantly locked into this. And to justify my use of it, it's like, oh my god, I haven't listened to any Spotify today, but I don't want to, I'm not paying for this. You know? Or like, I mean, I'm a bit stupid in this way. I've got like subscriptions to Netflix, Paramount, uh, Disney. And I realized last night, I haven't watched Paramount in like four months. Well, it's just like, why am I paying for this? So I cancelled it immediately. I, like, I haven't watched this for ages. Um, but we basically have a finite amount of time to consume what is pushed to us all the time. Therefore, we are encouraged to consume more. This is where the concept of the binge comes in. The binge is not accidental. It is by design. These services have been designed to encourage us to binge watch constantly because it makes it easy and frictionless to do so and we are tempted to do so because we're actually paying for this content. But what also happens here is the streaming platforms receive real-time data about the consumption of everything, from the content of shows to demographics of users. Everything that happens on those platforms is analyzed for data. That's why they're like social media platforms. Everything that goes on on a streaming platform to the very minutia of how long it is watched for to the second is consumed, that is produced and is measured, I should say. That means, I don't know if anyone's had this experience, that a show you start watching on Netflix and you think, oh, that's quite good, and they cancel it. Does that happen to anyone where you, like, you've watched something and you think, oh, and there's no second series, right? So there was this really childish cartoon a couple of years ago called Hoops about this foul-mouthed basketball coach. And I kind of like basketball, right? And I like foul mouth comedies. So this was right up my street, I'm all like cartoons. So I was like, it's ticking all my boxes. I thought it was really funny. No second series. I was devastated. It's like, that is really funny shit. Why are you doing Netflix? They analysed it. They analysed it in terms of who was watching it, for how long they were watching it, what demographic was watching it, and thought, nah, it's not worth it. So fuck you, Evans. You know, you enjoyed it. But we didn't have enough people of actual economic value, and your poor ass isn't going to save at Netflix. So you know um, we're going to make something that actually which hits you know 18 to 24 year olds rather than your sorry 40 year old ass. You know that's what well, basically what happened. Though that data changes what is produced, so culture itself comes from consumption. Our consumption is shaping culture. The stuff that we actually watch is encouraging them to make more of that stuff all the time. Now this doesn't just happen on like insular platforms like Netflix. For example, music labels are now highly integrated into TikTok and are major customers of TikTok to pick up what is viral on TikTok in terms of sounds and then commission artists to make that stuff tap into the virality of particular things. So we've got basically what we call cycles of viral production. Something hits, companies know about it in real time, go and produce more as quickly as possible of that exact same stuff because people really like that. 
and that's what's driving culture. So streaming is culture now. The behaviour of streaming, what streaming is and what we do with it, is powering what happens afterwards. Well, deep, right? So stop watching shit on fucking TikTok and then we won't have shit culture. Watch good stuff instead. Watch people getting hurt. I like stuff like that. And people going on fire. Uh, anything with fire and people getting hurt, it's right up my street. Watch more of that and then I'll be happy, all right? So, in 2022, when I wrote these slides, digital media... <laughs> <laughs> That's not supposed to admit that I haven't updated this slide in two, months, two years. I have updated the other slides at the beginning, by the way. But, um, digital media is primarily a means to distribute content for profit. And that goes for social media as well. And profitability in streaming culture comes from what we call disintermediation. The removal of things that come between things. Disintermediation is the great success story of digital media. Basically, if you remove friction between things, consumption becomes easier. So let's think. Here we go. We've all got one, right? To do everything this device allows me to do, in the past, what would I have needed? I would have needed a stereo. Some kind of you know, a Walkman or a Discman or something like that. In fact, for the quality of audio you get out of this digital audio, I would have needed a CD player, hundreds of pounds. I would have needed a DVD player to go with me all the way all across the place in order to watch all that content. I would also need a television set connected to television services to consume all that stuff. I would have also needed every newspaper every day. And I would have needed all the magazines as well. Etc. 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 These devices, uh, the, the key to understanding what they've done to media itself is through this um, intermediation. They have taken away all the friction that we used to have in the analog age. You don't need all that stuff anymore. You just need one of these. That has created huge amounts of profits because a service like Netflix now doesn't need giant offices doesn't need anything like that, doesn't need you know, somewhere to store all the programs, doesn't need to store all the film. It has one copy, which it uploads to its servers, and anyone in the world can access that copy as long as they have a subscription to the service. It's all disintermediated. Now, iTunes, for example, disintermediated music by eliminating CDs. In the 2000s, the market for physical media, CDs in particular at that time, which were the dominant form, completely collapsed thanks to iTunes. Why would you buy a CD when you can buy the songs you like for 99 cents? And then you've, you don't even have to store that bit of plastic anymore. So people's houses were filled with fucking CDs and DVDs and so on. Go on someone's house now, they haven't got any. They don't need any. People have got CDs and DVDs are weird. Who listens to I ain't got a CD player. I haven't got a DVD player. Unless you, if I didn't have a PlayStation 5, I wouldn't have a player for any of that stuff. If I don't use it to watch that stuff, I don't own any CDs or DVDs. And I find it weird that people have gone back to vinyl as well. So that was shit. There was a reason we got rid of that. It was shit. Why are you going back to this weird <laughs> shit anyway? Um, <coughs> streaming does two things then. It disintermediates, but it also deacquisitions. We don't own anything anymore. Now, the big thing was, in 1993, when I bought that second, the third studio album by Nirvana in utero, it was mine, I could hold it in my hands, I had it. Now, if I didn't like it, and if you didn't like that album, then you're some kind of imbecile, right? Because it's one of the best albums I've made. But if you didn't like it, well, you could sell it to somebody. Because it's yours, you own it. You know, you, or you could give it to a charity shop and they could make some money out of it and give it to the needy and poor or some shit. We can't do that with streaming stuff. We don't have the physical thing anymore. What do we own at the end of it? Um, nothing. Nothing's ours. It belongs to the company. So we don't have acquisitions of this kind anymore. 
well, our money isn't actually going into things which we actually own in any meaningful sense. Now, streaming creates limitless capacity because of the cloud. We've got higher fidelity, we've got access anyway, we've got limited, limitless catalogs. So these are all the bonuses that the streaming culture has brought us. But after spending 100 odd quid a year, sat down and worked out how much I spent on um, Spotify per year, is 108 quid. Um, what do I have to show for it? Nothing. Effectively, I have a thing that comes out in December that tells me what my listening habits were in the year, and I can post that to Instagram to advertise for Spotify, basically. That's it. Um, this is ultimately a completely disposable culture. Um, now, we might share information about what we watch, what we share, you know, what we listen to, in what Bordeaux would call cultural capital. What we do with it can accrue us some kind of capital in that sense, but it's not financial capital in any way. What has been disrupted by these services is something called flow. So flow is how television companies determined our consumption in the past. You might think this might be random, the way a television schedule was put together. It wasn't. It was designed and curated specifically to keep people locked into a station over time. Um, streaming has completely disrupted that, but we're still commodified nevertheless. And flow today, for me, is the great example of it is Twitch. It's like somebody's doing a live on Twitch later. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit here for three hours watching them play fucking Baldur's Gate three. So why don't you go and play yourself? It's my habit. But that's kind of where flow is now. Vloggers, like people we see on Twitch, are the quintessential aspects of streaming culture. Now that was once an emergent new thing. Um, vlogging like that and you know um, playthroughs and so on and let's plays and they practice in video game culture but now it's hegemonic and dominant and part of surveillance capitalism to the extent to which when people realized that twitch was going to be a big thing and the streaming of that nature was going to have an audience it was bought for 970 million dollars by amazon why would Amazon spend that amount of money on a platform like that? Because they knew they were going to get a shit ton of data in the surveillance capitalism model for it. So, let's think back to TikTok itself. Why is TikTok dominant? We have an unending consumption of ourselves over and over again. It is endless, operates at super fast speeds. We watch, we consume, we repeat. We are consumed. That's why TikTok is both glorious in a sense, but also incredibly dangerous, because it is remaking culture. What happens on TikTok becomes culture afterwards. Um, and it is the unending consumption of ourselves, unfortunately, and people may still struggle what I mean by this term, which I keep on repeating through the, model, through the module. By consuming ourselves, I don't mean that we're eating parts of our own bodies in some sort of self-cannibalistic ritual. What I mean is, we seek out content which, well, we don't even seek out. We are given content which is created for us, and we keep on consuming that content. We are consuming ourselves over and over and over again. And if we choose to make content, or indeed share content, it is content of us, basically, again and again and again and again. TikTok can also do all the things on Instagram, where people like to keep on watching on Instagram. It, it, yeah, it works the same way. Um, you know, sharing TikTok content on Instagram is an example of sharing yourself. Yeah, people basically. can do on Instagram too. So, in order to think about this for your projects, think about surveillance, commodification, unending consumption, what we produce and how the platform shapes that production, and who's consuming it. That will get you far. But the main message of this is that in the age of unending consumption, it's never going to end. There's no stop. It'll just be the next thing over and over again until you die. Have a nice week. <laughs> well, actually, see you tomorrow.